It's not uncommon for Christians to call themselves disciples of Jesus. And that's not too surprising, because disciple just means follower, and Christians are followers of Jesus. But in Mark 8, 34, Jesus offers a much stricter definition of disciple. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. Clearly, there's much more to being a disciple of Jesus than a simple click to subscribe. So exactly what is a disciple of Jesus? Up to this point, the Gospel of Mark has presented Jesus as superior in every way. He has unlimited power over physical matters, like sickness, and spiritual matters, like the human heart. Jesus proves he can solve global suffering and bring world peace. Yay! But Jesus first came not to end the world's troubles, but to suffer and die for sin. Sin is the reason the world is broken, and it can only be fixed when sin is gone. Jesus must suffer and die to satisfy the consequences of sin. And what Jesus, in Mark 8, 34, is calling his disciples to do is a powerful picture of what he is about to do. A disciple, then, is someone who takes his faith in Christ seriously. But how do you do this? You must first come to the end of yourself. That's what it means to deny yourself. You reject who you are, your goals, your desires, your sin, to follow his ways instead. How far must you go? You must be willing to die for Christ. That's what it means to take up your cross. You are committed to the point of shame and death. How long must it take? As long as it takes. That's what it means to follow Jesus. You never stop fighting to make Jesus your authority over every part of your life. That's a disciple of Jesus. That may sound hard, but here's the good news. Anyone willing to deny himself and follow Christ, no matter the cost, will be forgiven, will be saved, and will be his disciple. Hi, Rock Lexon. How we doing? A little delay there, so <laughs> okay with that. Hey, we're so glad you guys are all here. My name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here. And if you join us for the first time, uh, please do what Joel talked about. Go to the Welcome Center and take a connection card. We have some information for you about the church. We'd like to just visit for a while if you do that. And if you're watching on YouTube or watching on Facebook, we're so glad that you joined us today. Well, we are continuing our series called Marks of a Disciple. And one of the marks of a disciple, a disciple actually, the way we're reviewing it, is a follower of Jesus. Now, a true disciple is not just a student or a learner, but a true disciple is one who puts into action what they've learned from the one they're following, and that is Jesus Christ. So what we're talking about in this series is what are some of the marks of a disciple? Now, if you Google it, <clears throat> like we all do to start out, if you Google it, there's so many characteristics and traits of a disciple. I mean, there's some, some groups have 10, some have three, whatever. So what we did, uh, Andy and I decided that we will just pick out four. So Andy talked the first two weeks. I'll talk today. Pastor David will talk next week. And we each chose what we consider a mark of a disciple. And we'll be talking about that today. And and uh, the visual that we have is, is you see Jesus with the marks in his hands. So this is where we got the marks of a disciple because those of us who are set aside as followers of Jesus have mark, have certain marks, certain characteristics. And I want to talk today about what those are, what separates us from those who are not followers, but particularly those who are following Jesus and, and doing all they can to come closer to Jesus. And so uh, Pastor Andy kicked it off last two weeks ago, and he talked about the true mark of a disciple is the full trust in God. So he developed that. If you missed that, you can go to our website, hrclex.life. You can, you can play that there. Now, last week, he talked about one of the disciplines that as disciples that we should have, uh, is, and that is fasting. So if you missed that, also go to the website and then stop by the Welcome Center. We have some information about that because uh, he called last week a church-wide fast for those who are willing to, to participate. So he talked about that. Now today, what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about, I looked at all these options and I said, you know what, as a, as a follower, as a true disciple, what kind of community should we strive to be in? 
And so I decide that I'll be talking about what is a biblical community that a true disciple, as true disciples, that we should strive, you know, strive to be in. What does that look like? And how do we get there? And, and what are the pitfalls possibly of it? Or what should we, we be looking at? And, and so we'll start out when, when God created the earth. The very first thing he did was he created light. And he said what? He said it is good. Okay, then he created the heavens and the earth. And he said what? It is good. Then he created the, the animals and the plants. And he said again, it is good, right? Let's go to Genesis 2.18 and read this, verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. Okay, so let's get our, let's get our, our mind around this. So the very first thing that was created by God that he said is not good was solitude, was solitude. So the only thing he created was Adam. That he created that wasn't good was the fact that Adam was going to be alone. So what did he do? He created a, a, a wife for him. So think about this. So if you look at that, the first thing that wasn't good in the creation wasn't sin. You know, that came chapter 3 if you're reading Genesis. But the first bad thing that was created was not gluten. You know, some people would say that. The first bad thing that was created was not uh, spiders. A lot of people might say that. The first bad thing that was created was not uh, reality TV. You know, may want to fight on that. I'm convinced that the first bad thing that was created was the Dallas Cowboys. Now, if you've been here in the last 12 years, you know where that, that comes from. Anyway, not really. Maybe. I don't know. All right. Anyway. But so the first bad thing was Adam was all alone, so he created Eve. So it's not good for us to be alone because I'll be creating, th- I'll be talking throughout this message that nothing good happens in isolation. It just doesn't, right? For example, if you go through the Bible, when David, King David, isolated himself, what did he do? He ended up falling and in, in having an affair with Bathsheba. Okay, Solomon when he isolated himself, he ended up marrying hundreds of wives that brought him further away from Jesus. Elijah, when he isolated himself, he became very, very depressed. Judas, when Judas isolated himself, what did he do? He, he killed himself, right? So nothing good happens when we're disconnected from community because we were made for community. And, and if when we disconnect from community, we're in danger of suffering. For example, an analogy might be if you build a fire, okay, you've got logs in it, maybe you put coal in it. Okay, if you were to take out one of those coals or one of the logs, the embers, and lay it aside, the fire is going to keep going, right? It's all together. But what's going to happen to that coal piece of coal or that ember? You know, that's going to die away, right? The British theologian John Wesley said that there is no such thing as a solitary Christian. Now, another quote he was given was that there's, there's nothing more unchristian than to be in solitary. So I, I like this one. There's no such thing as being a solitary Christian. Why? Because nothing good happens when we are isolated. You know, we've all seen, maybe you have, you've all seen the National Geographic videos, right? I remember I went to Kenya several years, five years ago on a mission trip, and we were the last day we were able to go on a big safari. Yeah, photos so far. I'm not shooting animals. Um, and, and during this time, you know, you see a lot of things. We saw the animals we wanted to see. But one that really amazed me were the gazelles. They're beautiful and they're fast. And so you, if you picture a lot of times on National Geographic, you see the gazelles and they're out and they're, they're grazing. And, you know, there's one that's grazing. Let's call him Gary the gazelle, okay? So Gary's grazing. And all of a sudden he looks up and something's just not feeling right. He's not exactly sure what it is. So he goes back to grazing. Well, all of a sudden, boom, all the other gazelles are running for their lives because what happened? There's a lion. There's a lion that's trying to get that. And here's old Gary. He's just kind of looking around, you know, to and, and he doesn't realize what's going on. So if you know the end of how this would end, at the end of the video, what happens? Gary doesn't exist anymore. They've caught him. So the camera pulls back, and it's slow motion. But, but see, the rest of the gazelles knew that there was an enemy prowling, seeking who to devour. 
And there is poor Gary, who is not paying attention. So in our lives, you know, <clears throat> and maybe we've been guilty of this, there's that one guy, or that one person who who is out doing his own thing and doesn't pay attention and is isolated. And the danger is in isol- pure isolation. That, that could be a problem. See, the enemy, the enemy knows the lion didn't go after the whole herd, right? What did the enemy, what did they do? They, they just went after one. They went after the one that was the straggler. So the enemy goes after those who think they can do it on their own. Those who say, hey, I'm big enough and I'm, I'm strong enough. I can do this on my own, which could be last words. See, the enemy always goes, Satan always goes after the, more times than not, loves it when someone's in isolation and he can do it. Now, if you do a Google search, which is what I seem to do before I do a message, is the word community has, I couldn't believe this, 4.4 billion, actually billion, hits on the word community. I actually saw a study, I was looking for different studies, I saw one about American men, and this study showed that one out of every five American men do not have a close male friend. Isn't that amazing? I saw some other statistics that were even higher number than that. So see, we're, we, uh, we, we are surrounded by community, and one of the things that we're doing now is maybe we're not lazy, but we're trying to reach out is what? Social media. And I think we get to the point, some of us, where all of a sudden we start thinking of social media as what? Anti-social media, which it can be. So here's the problem. You know, we have all these friends on social media. Let's take Facebook. And we have a lot of friends that we know. How many people do we actually know in our friends list? If you ever, you know, maybe you run into a Facebook friend. You got all these friends and you're shopping for groceries, Right. And you see, a, you see a friend, you go, hey, Jim, how was that trip to Florida? How are the kids? And Jim goes like, who are you? <laughs> what, what do you? How do you know about my life? Well, you mistake them because of your many, many friends. And, and what he may think you were doing is you were Facebook stalking him. I don't know, right? But, it really, but we really don't know each other. And, and that's it's how life works today. So much of our life is what? Online, right? You know, we can actually, many of you have done this, probably all of us, you can buy groceries online, right? Have them delivered. You can buy food, have it delivered. Medicine, have it delivered. There's almost nothing that you can't secure today, procure, that you can't get online. Um, we watch movies online. You know, we watch uh, church online. Nothing wrong watching church online unless... It becomes more of a convenience. Maybe you couldn't be here, but if it's more of a convenience, that's something to look at. So, so here's what we've come to, I think. It's possible to have a life where we never have to step outside our homes. Isn't that, isn't that something? You talk about being isolated more. Think about this. If we decide that we never have to leave our house, what we can do, we can sell our car online, right? We don't need a car, so we could do that. This is what the world is headed to, a life of isolation, if we're not careful. You know, but maybe, and I've been this way, maybe maybe you've had seasons of isolation for whatever reason. And when that happens, you can be slowly dying inside. You can be slowly dying inside. Because God is the one that created us to function better in community. He wired us to work well with other people. And when we don't do that, we can tend to wither away. As a matter of fact, the, you take the Ten Commandments, the last six of the Ten Commandments are all about community. You know, that should say something there. There are 58, at least 58, uh, verses, Scripture in the Bible that talk about one another. You know, forgive one another, love one another, care for one another, accept one another. So guess what? We cannot do these things unless what? Unless we're with another. So what does Jesus do when he starts his ministry? He, cl- he gets a group of 12. That's his first community. Now, he lives, you know, in a vast area, like all, the, all, the, all the Middle East, but he really spends his time mainly with those 12 who are going to carry on his mission. Now, so what he does, Jesus opens up his lives to these 12. 
These disciples are doing community with him. Now, after Jesus' death and burial and, and resurrection and ascension, the disciples go on and carry on the mission that Jesus left them with because as a, as a follower, as a disciple of Christ, we're to put into action what we've learned from those we're following. For example, uh, they took it the very first day that they, on Pentecost, what happened? They took this message to the streets and 3,000 people were saved that day and more the next day. So this whole thing that the disciples were doing was being lived out in community. And I'm going to talk about how that community can be a biblical community. Um, a very familiar verse to a lot of us is Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And uh, Acts is the fifth book in the New Testament. I want to read this. This is what this, this community uh, had expanded from the 12 disciples. Verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the, in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in pray and prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as everyone had need. Again, this is that community. So continuing daily with one, and with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Man, think about that. I mean, wouldn't you like to have been part of that, what was going on, and, and a real community that grew rapidly because of following Jesus, and, and you're with other people, you're together, you're praying, you're, you're doing outreach like we do here, you're, you are breaking bread together, you're growing together, and you're taking each other further to Jesus. For example, our, our kids, I can imagine the kids they had were hanging out with each other, and they're praying together, and the, the disciples continued doing miracles. What a great community that was. So now the disciples are in the world, and they're seeing this whole city of Jerusalem where this started. And they're seeing what it's become, what it means to do life together. And they, in turn, changed the whole world. They, they changed the world. So wouldn't you like a life like that? Well, see, a true disciple seeks community. But we've got to make sure it's the right community. That's the mark of a disciple. You know, the response may be, well, I ain't got no time for that. I, I mean, I don't have enough time. I've got... Uh, how, how would I, how, I got kids, I'm married, I, I work a double shift, I, I'm on third shift, and how in the world am I going to have all this community and, and do all these things together? Well, I, I, I know we got to do that to, to survive. But first off, we need to check our priorities. You know, imagine, imagine how exciting it would be to, how fulfilling it would be to, to really be, to know people, not just on Facebook, and to really, really, truly be known, Right? I mean, to encourage each other to do life together, to pray together, and maybe do some miracles together through the Holy Spirit. Friends, that's what we're made for. We are made by God for community. Now, I understand that there are other obligations. We have lives. We have other lives other than church, and we have jobs. But that doesn't make it less important. You know, I can remember. I can remember in all the very important times in my life that I look back on and. I've lived 73 years, and I've had a lot of experience. Um, like when I was baptized, when I was ordained, you know, during the seasons of revival, during uh, sad times, uh, during happy times. It, as I think back on this, and every one of those, and some of you were involved in disciples were there to be there with me, to, to share, to love, and to carry me through what are sometimes bad times. Is, this is a biblical community. So let's do this. Let's define what a biblical community is so we can be on the same page. Okay, here's what I think. Biblical community is when two or more people who intentionally do life together committed to living out the way of Jesus. So let's translate that in length more. Here's what it says. There's two or more people get together and they say, hey, let's become disciples. Let's go to Jesus. Let's go further to Jesus. So see, the idea of real biblical community, there is a difference. There's something called community. Like I said, Google had 4.4 billion options to go through. 
But this community is a group of people who get together with a shared interest, but they take it further because we have in our lives a lot of community, the community banks, their community pools, community par- uh, parks, uh, community neighborhood, you know, community home, homeowners groups. But in biblical community, it's when two or more people look at each other and say, hey, let's go to Jesus together. So what we're going to talk about today is what biblical community is. But to do that, let's talk about what it's not. You know, let's look at some things that, that we may think, well, Mike, I'm in biblical community. Well, listen to what I'm saying here because that unless we're seeking Jesus in these communities that we're in, it's not a biblical community. Okay, here it is. The first biblical community, the first thing biblical community isn't. Biblical community is not our family. Now, there is an exception to this. Now, by default, it's not. For the reality is that, you know, some of us don't enter into biblical community with our families. Now, we're, we're married. We've got a lot of, we got kids. Maybe, maybe it's in a multi-relation, multi-generational house where you have different generations living together. Now, there's nothing, there's nothing to say that we can't be in biblical family, but chances are that unless you strive together that there's someone leading this, it wouldn't be considered biblical community. But what you do, you fulfill that part of your life about, about, um, about being together, about family. But are you growing together to Jesus? If not, it's just community. But there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not biblical community. Okay, number two, biblical community is also not our friends. Here we've got to be very careful. We all know that there's a difference between having friends and having friends who get us closer to Jesus, right? You know what I'm talking about. We have some friends that would rather get us to the club than to get us to church. Or we have friends that would rather introduce us to that girl or that, that guy or that gal than introducing us to Jesus, taking it further. You know, we can be in community with friends, but we need to be in community. Some of the community we need to be in is ones that are taking us closer to Jesus. You know, we all have relationships. I've had a lot in all my years. Some of the wrong relationships, maybe we're dating the wrong person, we're hanging out with no good people, or just hanging out doing nothing. But to an extent, there's really nothing wrong with some of that, but it's not biblical. There's that old saying, you show me your friends, and I'll show you your future, right? For example, if I brought some of your friends up here and just looked at them and analyzed them and talked to them a little bit, what would that tell me about your future? or some of your past friends. Here's the tricky thing about friends. If we're not careful here, what's going to happen is we'll hang out with the wrong people. And we'll get that, that itch, that itch for, for community and, and for acceptance and for, for involvement. And that may lead us, with Satan being the enemy that's prowling around, lead us into the wrong, to the wrong relationships. So what happens is we trick ourselves in saying, I don't need biblical community. I'm in community. Just be careful. What else is biblical community not? It is not social media. Duh. (laughs) I think we all know that by now. Just because you've got 2,000 friends on Facebook doesn't mean you know, actually know, 2,000 friends, right? Wouldn't you agree with that? Maybe you've got 900 people following you on Instagram. Again, do 900 people really, really follow you? But do we actually have a relationship with them? We can have a lot of acquaintances, but not in that community. And lastly, biblical community is also not, when you hear this, it's not attending church. All right? Seeing people from 930 to 1030 and from 11 to noon on Sunday isn't necessarily biblical community. It's a part. It's a part. It's a starting point. Think about it. Because we, there, are, there may be, uh, there's no intentionality possibly of doing life together. Now, yes, we can have shared experiences. For example, I can have shared experiences this afternoon when I go to the grocery store. You know, I'm sharing the experience in this community of shoppers. You know, I'm in line, I'm waiting, and the guy behind me, and I say, hey, man, you like apples, right? And he goes, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, think about this. So, so here you talk to, maybe you talk to someone else here out in the lobby drinking coffee. And you say, hey, you love Jesus? I love Jesus, right? Okay, I'll see you next week. And we don't do anything about that community, that relationship. Can you imagine in the first century church, 
this wonderful environment I talked about that disciples were in. Can you imagine if they're doing all this work and hundreds and even thousands of people are being saved and all of a sudden they do all this work all week and it's Friday at 6 o'clock and one of them goes, okay, that's a wrap. I'll see you next week. You know, they didn't do that. That should be an example for us. We should be tireless. See you next Saturday. And they get on their donkeys and, and they go away. You see, we're at church and it's kind of like watching a movie, right? You know, I mean, that's not only online, but, you know, it, it's, it's watching a movie. You're, you're spectators rather than disciples at this point hitting the streets. Now, we're trying to prepare ourselves so we can hit those streets and develop and build that biblical community. So here's what it can be like. We can be like a big family reunion. You know, it's great in here, the, the fellowship we do, and it's beautiful. We're all under one room together, okay? But I think that's the starting block, use a track analogy, the starting block of a race. You know, this is the launching pad. This is, this is where we hear the word, and, and we are challenged by, by the speaker, and, and we're challenged by the great music that comes from the, the worship band. And here's what happens to a lot of us is we get fired up, you know, we're heard that great message or we're fired up and, and we're ready to go. And, and, you know, 12 o'clock comes around and, and the gun goes off, if you will. And what do you do? We go to our car and we go home, right? So would it kill us to spend 10 minutes, maybe introduce yourself to someone, maybe a new person or someone you really would like to know better? Here's an idea. How about join a connect group? Join a connect group or go to a Bible study or get your kids involved in high rock kids or get your kids involved, the middle of high schoolers in these students. <laughs> See, we're not in biblical community unless we leave here intentionally committed to doing life together outside of this holy hour. To living out the way of Jesus, that's called real biblical community. Okay, so if, that's, if I told you what I think biblical community is not, then what is biblical community? What is biblical community? Biblical community is biblically, biblical community is where we are real and not rejected. Now think about this is so important. Think about this. Let's go back to, to Genesis chapter 3. When you, read, you can read there where Adam and Eve sinned. And I'm going to go to it myself. I just jumped up. Now, if you remember this, that what happens is they, they sin, and then, um, so, so they sin, and then Adam decides he, he's got a brilliant plan. What's he going to do? He's going to hide from God, right? And see, and God comes in, he says, you know, Adam, you know, why are you hiding? And see what Adam is, what, what God is doing, he wants to hear Adam admit what his sin was, what he did wrong. And he's, he's going like, Adam, say it. You know, I just want to hear you say it. And so here's what Adam says in Genesis 3, verse 10. So he, Adam, says, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. So here's what Adam is saying. He's saying, God, I messed up. Not only did I mess up, I am a mess up. I'm a failure. I failed you. So if you see me again, God, you're not going to like me. So see, isn't that kind of true of us today that we get embarrassed with some of our sin, even though we know that not to do it intentionally, but it can be forgiven on the cross. So here's what we do. Sometimes, sometimes uh, we, we may reject being in a group just because we, we have the feeling we may, be, we may be rejected. It may not be intentional. It may be rejected. Sometimes we reject people first by not going to the group. I'm just going to stay on the outside. I'm afraid if I get in there, people are going to see who I really am. But see, every one of us has a desire built in us to be real. You ever wear a mask? How about this? How many of us have people in our lives that we can really take our mask off and let them see the real us? You know, how about this? Hey, I've got a perfect marriage mask. Hey, my kids aren't driving me crazy, mask. Hey, everything is good in my life, mask. How about this one? I have been guilty of this in the past. How about we come to church with our church person mask on? 
You know what that mask is. You meet at the door, the first impression person, hey, glad you're here. We're glad you're here. And you go, hey, man, good morning, brother. Amen, brother. You know, the sun is shining and God's mercies are new every day. You keep the mask on and you go under your breath. You go, gee, I just had a flat tire. We argued all the way to the church. I don't have any money. See, we need a place to take our mask off without makeup without the gloss. So, hey, this is the real me. This is it. You got, this is what you get. And we can actually be in that context and not fear any kind of rejection or guilt. Is there a place on the earth where that should be happening? Oh yeah, we're in here. (laughs) We're at the church. It should be everywhere, right? But we need to learn how to do that here because of the scripture. We're in that biblical community and it teaches us how to do that. You know, maybe, maybe you were hurt in another environment, maybe this church, hope not. Um, and you heard people were talking about you. Isn't that terrible? I mean, and you heard that they were prey gossiping. Have you ever heard of that? You pray gossiping, you know, you're together and you go like, okay, hey, will you pray for Jim? He's drinking again. You know, maybe that happened to you. And, and uh, or maybe on Facebook, I know this happens to some people in my family. You ever been dissed on Facebook. Oh my, how could you do that? How could you argue on Facebook? So, so I'm saying that we collectively have to be committed to finding environments where people will not reject us. This is a biblical community. If it's a true community, because God loved Adam and Eve through their mess, didn't he? And that's the perfect example. That's the testimony for us to know what Jesus, God can do through us through the cross. I was thinking of 1 Peter 4, 8. 1 Peter is near the end of the New Testament. It says this, And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Isn't that great? Fervent means a warmth or warm and, and, and intense. Perhaps we see the other person only in their past sins. I've got some good friends that I know their past. They've shared it with me, or I've shared my past with them. But they see through that because I was forgiven on that cross by what Jesus Christ did. And God did not want us to be alone. So here's what I think. I think that, that it, love does cover a, a multitude of sins for the person that we're maybe working with, but also for ourselves. We need that. Here's what we need in a church. The pastors and the staff talk about this all the time. We need a glue. We need a glue here that's, that, that, that can be bigger than a great message from the praise team or can be bigger than, than a good sermon. And, you know, I hear people walking out and they'll say, hey, man, boy, the music was off the chain today. It was great. Love that song. Love what they did. And then you like the message and it inspired you and said you really get fired up. And then you come back next week and, and, and maybe the songs are not what you thought and you start getting kind of disappointed or maybe the message didn't quite hit home to you. And you go like, no, oh, man, I don't know if I, this is really where I need to be. And you think about, you, you think about not coming back, or maybe you think about just staying away for a little bit. Or how about this? All right, you, you come in this great first impression person, and and they accidentally said something or didn't say something, and and you can be offended. Or what if Andy or I did something or said something? Or what if we didn't say something or do something? You see, what's going to happen is, 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 is. It, it, you get to see the real us because we all make mistakes. And you can look at those who made that person, the first impression person, or me or Andy or, or, or Rich or, or David, and you can say, you know, these guys, they're not Jesus. You know, they're working toward Jesus. So either can be offended or work through it, let love handle a multitude of sins. And that's what biblical community teaches us, that whenever people show us the real them, we can actually have love to cover up the sins. So, another. What biblical community is, I'll end with this. Biblical community is where we are made better. Where we're made better. You know, if you wear the mark of a disciple, you know, we're actually made better. You know, for example, you can stream online, you can, you can come into the room, but is there a true life change as we go through the door or we stop watching the, the, the video? You know, we can't just limit ourselves to not going any further. What are we going to do with what we learned, what we experienced? 
For example, Pastor Andy, if you were here last week or watched it on the, on the website, hrclex.life, he talked about one of the, one of the marks of a, of a, of a disciple is to, do, is to fast. And we have one you know, coming up next week, this week, tomorrow, actually. But maybe you've never fasted, and maybe it's intriguing to you. Maybe you prayed, and, and the Holy Spirit is prompting you to do this. You know, so when you leave here, are you going to be fired up? Yeah, that's great. I'm going to do it. Or you lose it in trying to watch a football game or go to where you're going to eat. But if we live in community, of a true community, and strive for that, a biblical community, we can't help but get better together. Proverbs 27, verse 17 is a very familiar. It says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Well, that's a big old word there, countenance. So I went to another one. Let's do the Amplified Translation. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens and influences another. Yeah, but here's the principle. Iron can only sharpen iron if it's doing what? If it's making contact. Hey, I'm sharpening. No, you're not. It's got to make. It's got to make contact. You know, like maybe, maybe you're over here, and, and and someone else is over here. You're really not making contact, but we have that opportunity in the environments that we create here to do that. Connect groups, Bible study, fellowship, outreach. There's so many opportunities we have to do that, and so there really is no reason that we can't do that. Biblical community is where we're being made better together. And, and, and to try to think of a, a story, I remember the story of, it's in three of the Gospels, where the, the four friends had a friend that was paralyzed. And, and Jesus was in town preaching and doing miracles. And, and the place where Jesus was was crowded, man. I mean, people were everywhere. You couldn't even get in there. And these four friends, they didn't give up, did they? What did they do? They picked up the mat. They found a way to get on the roof and opened up the roof to lower their friend in to see Jesus. I, I think of that when I think of, of someone who's in trouble. Would, would I go, would we go to the, as far as we, doing things we wouldn't think about doing to help that person? You know, there are going to be days where you're depressed. I get depressed. And you don't want to see anybody except my dog, right? But we need friends who won't take, don't take no for an answer. Hey, I'm okay. I don't need friends. No, I'm coming over. I'm going to help you, right? So whose life are you going to speak over? Or whose life are you going to allow to speak over you in a biblical community? Another verse that that I think says this so well. Has anyone ever fallen, (laughs) fallen off from uh, whatever you were doing? Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes is Old Testament behind Proverbs. Ecclesiastes 4.10 For if they fall, if a friend falls, if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him. I have fallen so many times. And I have people I can call. I have people that I've called. I have talked to some of you in here. Pastor um, Eddie Scott is my accountability partner. I go to him a lot. We have people we need to to call. They're going to help take us to Jesus. You know, because there's going to be days where our marriage isn't exactly like the honeymoon was. There are going to be days where our kids are driving us crazy. It never happens here, right? There are going to be days where maybe your boss is not being, he's kind of maybe being a jerk. So my whole life is falling apart. My health is failing. Who do you know in your life that's going to be there to help, to pick you up? And you, I, I want someone that's gonna that's gonna carry me kicking and streaming down, screaming down the street, to put a hole in the roof, to get me the help I need, to get me closer to Jesus. It's dangerous to fall alone. So we break bread together, we laugh together, we cry with each other. We are made better together. So this brings me to this. What opportunities do we have here at High Rock? Our messages, the main point is our messages. We understand that in studying the Bible. But what else do we make available that can get us into that community? And many of us have already experienced a lot of these, and that's good. That's good because you know how awesome that can be. And and maybe there's a time where something happened and someone in that group picked you up or helped you. 
So there's plenty of ways to do it. You've got, uh, you've got the, you, you leave here, you've got, you've got connect groups, you've got Bible study, we've got outreach. The leaders had a meeting the other day about outreach, all the outreach we're going to do this year. You've got a fellowship just together in the events that we do. Uh, even, even we're even doing that. Pastor Rich is even getting the, our students familiar with this by having at their age, middle and high school, small groups, so they can experience what it's like to be in a smaller group, a community group, a biblical group. So that's that's that's, that's awesome, isn't it? So what we're going to do next week is we're going to have in the lobby tables set up, and we're going to have the leaders. If, if their schedule permits, the leaders of of the 12 connect groups that we're now we're kicking off in March. Some are going on now. Yeah, that's good. Thank you, Rich. Thank you. You know, we had a very healthy program. We had a very healthy system uh, program, but COVID kind of stopped everything. So we're now we're reviving it. We're going to be start. Some are meeting now. Some will start meeting in March. So next week we'll have uh, these these 12 groups outside. We'll have pictures. We'll have some of the resources they're going to use. We will have, hopefully, before and after every service, the leaders of these groups so they can answer questions. And these are incredible groups. There's activity groups for, and then there's uh, there's activity groups for men. Uh, we're even starting a Spanish group, Hispanic group. So we got that, and they're going to be inviting others to come. Uh, we have a marriage group. Um, we're, we're going to have, we're going to have, we're actually, we're going to have a very interesting group. We're going to have a group that's we haven't thought of a name yet, but this is all the craziness that's going on now through the pandemic, through biblically, through whatever, through the government. Are, you know, we're, we're preparing ourselves with, with the scripture, right? But how about physically? Are we prepared? You know, are we prepared for a tragedy or for a, a, a disaster? And this is going to be a very fa- interesting group. And the, the guys that are leading that, uh, they'll be talking about that next week. I don't want to give a whole commercial on everything, but, but please give, give a thought to coming next week and, and checking those out because you're not going to be rejected. You're going to be encouraged. If you fall, they're going to pick you up. Maybe you'll find a new friend that you didn't have before. Just go out and reach out of your, your, your comfort zone. But it's going to be awesome. And I just hope on behalf of yourselves and, and the church, uh, that we do look at those groups next week, okay? A deal? Anybody going to do it? I hope so. Okay, let's pray. Father God, we, we love you so much, Lord, and, and, and what a great day it's been to, to share your word through the Scripture. And, and Lord, I just am so thankful that, that we have this opportunity, that, that this is the launching pad, this is the starting point of, 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 of biblical community. And, Lord, we don't want to make light of the importance of the service, but we really want to encourage all of us to do more after the service. We want to be in that biblical community. So, Lord, we just thank you for that opportunity, and thank you for these leaders that are taking their time and and their love to help us out. And the first step of of being a disciple, the first step of a mark of a disciple is is the opening point. It's the entry level, the entry point. And what is that? That is being a disciple means that you actually believe Jesus Christ is real. You believe that Jesus Christ did what has been prophesied, that he came to this earth, this broken world. You can read about that starting in Genesis 3. And he came and he said, look, uh, I know you're messed up just like Adam and Eve did, but I love you through that. I will clean up your mess up. And it's it's easy. It's not classes you take, and it's not a a, a time period on it. It's as simple as saying, you know what? I believe Jesus is really who he said he is. I believe that God sent Jesus to this broken world, to me, to my broken life, to give me an opportunity to change that. And all it takes is for me to believe it is true and to believe that Jesus willingly gave up his life on the cross. And then when he did, for those of us who gave him our mess up, He cleaned it up in God's eyes. And we're not perfect. We're not going to be until we get in heaven with Jesus and God. But in God's eyes, we are made perfect. And Jesus sealed the deal by going to the the cross and willingly giving up his life. And then as prophesied, he went to the tomb. And three days later, he walked out of the tomb, proving he is who he said he is. Of all the religions and all, all the faiths in all the world, Ours is the only one that has our leader living now, alive, having walked out of the tomb. 
So if you want to make that decision today, then, then God bless you. We'll help you do that. Hang around, see me or one of the other pastors. Come forward, whatever you want to do. So, Lord, we just love you so much. And thank you for the opportunity we have to cut a hole in the roof to bring whoever needs to be brought closer to Jesus. And we love you for that, Lord. We just love you so much. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for saving us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.